Good morning, everyone. I'll just give it about two minutes for all our audience to join us and then we'll begin. Thank you. All right. Good morning to all our guests today. Thank you for making the time to join this webinar on mitigating vaccine hesitancy. I'd like to start off by introducing myself. I'm Tawanga Chiralika. I'm the Senior Advocacy Associate at PATH, a global nonprofit dedicated to achieving health equity. And I'll be moderating the discussion today. This webinar is a collaboration between the South African Health Products Regulatory Authority, SAPRA, who many of you may know are uh, tasked with regulating, monitoring, evaluating, investigating, inspecting, and registering all health products and clinical trials in South Africa, as well as the National Department of Health and the South African Health Technologies Advocacy Coalition. Um, until recently, we know that less than a third of the adult population was fully vaccinated. The goal, as we many, as many of us may know, is to reach herd immunity, a state where the virus is minimally transferred by the end of 2021. To safely achieve herd immunity against COVID-19, a substantial proportion, about 67% of the population would need to be vaccinated lowering the overall amount of virus that is able to spread in the whole population. That is why we have gathered a panel of experts to help us with a conversation on our perceptions as the public, as well as misinformation on vaccination. Please allow me to introduce our expert panel. Firstly, we have Ms. Flora Matlala. Ms. Matlala is the Pharmacovigilance Manager at SAPRA where she's highly knowledgeable of the science and the activities relating to the detecting, assessing, understanding and preventing adverse effects for any other med medicine or vaccine related problems. She is also joined by Bishop Mpulwana. While Bishop Mpulwana is the Secretary General of the South African Council of Churches, he will be speaking in his capacity as the chairperson of the Multisectoral Ministerial Advisory Committee on Social Behavioral Change as a non-statutory committee appointed by the Minister of Health to provide high level strategic advice to the Ministers of Health, Social Development and COCTA on the management of the COVID-19 breakout in South Africa. Um, to mention the multi-sectoral MAC is made up of individuals from faith-based organizations NGOs representing various sectors and vulnerable groups of our society, organized labor representing health workers, as well as traditional leaders and traditional healers. Um, they are also joined by Prof. Hanali Mayer. Prof. Mayer is the chair of the National Immunization Safety Expert Committee, NISEC, as well as head of the South African Vaccination and, and Immunization Center at Sepako Makatso Health Sciences University. We are also joined by Dr. Saul Johnson. Dr. Johnson is a public health expert as well as the head of the health practice at Genesis Analytics and, and is also part of the Solidarity Fund. Lastly, and certainly not least, you may have questions and you can pose your questions in our Q&A function to ask them and we will try to get them to the, at the end of the program. But we also have experts on hand that are ready to um, to respond throughout the program. I'd like to thank uh, Prof. Rose, Rose Burnett, um, as well as Dr. Kerrigan McCarthy, 
Prof. Wiesonge, as well as Prof. von Gottenberg that uh, will be assisting us to respond to some of the questions that um, you may have in the Q&A. So without further ado, um, I kindly invite Ms. Flora to please go ahead and start us off with a presentation from SAPRA. Over to you, Flora. Thank you so much, uh, Taonga. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Flora. Um, I am the Vigilance Unit Manager, as uh, Taonga has indicated. So I am going to take you through a few slides that I have put together in order to um, come with the safety perspectives uh, in terms of ensuring that our vaccines are available that are available on the market, they are of safety, efficacy, and acceptable quality. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, so this is my presentation outline. I would not necessarily go through it. Thank you. Next slide, please. Okay, so what I started with in my presentation is just to give a, a, a basic overview about vaccine hesitancy. What is vaccine hesitancy? So vaccine hesitancy, it refers, it refers to the delay in acceptance or refusal of vaccination despite availability of vaccination services. So as we have seen with the COVID-19 vaccines, the vaccines are available and they are available to the public on free of charge. However, we do have um, quite a number of uh, the population that is still not uh, accepting vaccination. So this basically refers to that. And it's influenced by a number of factors such as complacency, convenience, and confidence. So we still need to respect that other people, they will still have uh, concerns. So these are some of the reasons why we still have vaccines, uh, vaccine hesitancy. And it has been listed as one of the top greatest health threats by the WHO in 2019. So I thought I should just provide a brief um, background about the <clears throat> vaccine hesitancy. Next slide, please. So what are the key drivers for COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy? So thanks to the vet students, I was offered an opportunity to be a moderator where they were actually tackling vaccine hesitancy a few weeks ago together with the BCG group. So some of the information or most of the information on this slide is actually coming from there. So the key drivers that have been identified by the vet student, pharmacy vet student is that um, socioeconomic background is one of the reasons why we 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 seeing this vaccine hesitancy. And that is actually um, influenced by affordability, by political influence and residential area. So basically where the person resides, then if there's negativity around vaccine uh, uptake, then obviously that would affect them. The political influence, if one political party is actually in power and then it does not maybe support or the other that's not in party doesn't support the COVID-19 questions, <clears throat> If you are affiliated with that particular political party, then chances of you taking that particular vaccine, it actually becomes lessened. So these are some of the issues that have been identified. Then secondly, is the knowledge and the resources of information. So the information sources where most of our population get information from, that will include the television, it will include the social media and people they know. And what are the chances of one actually getting facts out of these sources of information, it becomes quite limited, particularly on the social media and the people that you know, which might not necessarily have the correct background in terms of the vaccines. So these are the key drivers, some of the key drivers, and then fear of the possible side effects. So my responsibility basically is to talk around the fear of the possible side effects, which I'm going to address. <clears throat> And then lastly, as part of the key drivers for COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy, it's about the medical context and the background, which ties with the knowledge and resources of information. So it has been highlighted that 80% of the vaccinated people think they have a good understanding of how vaccine works. And furthermore, 79% um, of the study that has been undertaken by the 
uh, one of the universities in South Africa indicate that vaccine acceptance is higher among people who say they know a lot about COVID-19 vaccines. So this indicates that knowledge is actually power because the people who are actually being vaccinated are the people who have information about this. So 34% of the people were found to be scared of possible side effects as highlighted under the knowledge and the sources. And 36% of this admitted to not understand how vaccine works. They feared side effects and infertility and black clots. And all this, they actually drive towards the knowledge gaps and the misinformation. Next slide, please. So I thought um, in order for our public to have an understanding about the post-marketing uh, surveillance, that are in place, we need to provide some kind of background because the background will actually assist in terms of the understanding of why do we have vaccines today? Why do we have medicines on the market today? Why do we need to combat vaccine hesitancy? So late in the 1950s and 1960s, there was a drug uh, that was known to be one of the greatest drug in the market known as thalidomide. And this drug was used in 46 countries by women who were pregnant or <clears throat> who subsequently became pregnant, and this was used to treat morning sickness. However, at that point in time, there were no testing of drugs that were in place. So the regulation of medicines was not necessarily in place. So these were used in these pregnant women uh, with no prior knowledge about how the product um, is performing. Therefore, what happened is that it has resulted in more than 10,000 children born with a range of severe deformities, such as for Comelia. And for Comelia, uh, to make it easier, I provided a definition that it's a, that it's a birth defect that can affect the upper and or the lower limbs. And some of the results of this, it included miscarriages. I was fortunate enough to be in the WHO um, conference in 2017, where I met one of the people who actually suffered for Comelia, and it was great to see that in real life. So while initially deemed to be safe in pregnancy, concerns regarding the birth defects were noted in 1961, and then the medication was removed from the market in Europe that year. Then follow on, this is how the regulation of medicines actually was born, particularly post-marketing pharmacovigilance. So where do us as SABRA fits in into this? So as Tonga has indicated that we are tasked with a mandate in South Africa. And this mandate, it, it includes monitoring, evaluating, investigating, inspecting, and registering all health products that are available in the market. So it is our responsibility as SABRA to ensure that all the products that we make available in the market, they actually, we ensure that they are um, of acceptable safety, efficacy, and quality. So that is our mandate. And that it, as a result of the thalidomide uh, disaster that, what, that happened in the 1960s. Next slide, please. Okay, so we as SAPRA, we subscribe to global good regulatory practice principle as we undertake our mandate. And what are these principles? I will only talk to few. For instance, legality, we need to ensure that everything that we do is as per the um, legal uh, requirements. And further then, furthermore, we are transparent about the kind of information that becomes available to us because what we do, it actually deals with the life of the people. Our responsibility is to uh, ensure the safety of uh, our population. We need to be independent in decision-making and not be influenced by any other organization. And then we need to be impartial as we do this uh, decision. Next slide, please. Okay, so I thought I should provide then an overview about how we ensure the safety. And this actually it talks to the overview development, <clears throat> drug development and registration and post-marketing surveillance there of, of the product. What happens when a, a product um, gets registered ultimately? So before a product can actually get registered, um, there are a number of steps that I am of the opinion that the public needs to be aware of. The development basically, the drug development, excuse me, the drug development, it starts with preclinical studies. So the preclinical studies basically, these are lab studies where the testing of the molecule is done in animals, in animal models so that we can see whether this, it's a potential 
molecule that, and that can actually be taken forth for further development so that ultimately it can be registered. Then once the preclinical studies then, they can show that this particular product, it's safe and it's effective against the particular medication. And therefore, then we take it to the next, uh, it's safe and effective rather, then we take it to the next step, whereby now, we are going to test it in human beings because we are happy with the models, the animal models that have been used. And in most cases, the, the animal models that are used, they will be more representative of the human beings. Then we move to the phase one. The phase one um, of the clinical trials, this is when we introduce the product into the humans. So in this case, we are looking for healthy individuals. We use this um, we actually use 20 to 80 people in this phase of the clinical trials, whereby we particularly look at the safety. How is the people reacting to this particular product? And there is an intense monitoring because now this is the uh, first time that we introduce this product into the human beings. And then once that product, it has passed the phase one, then it will move into the phase two trial. And the phase two trial, that's where now, we have um, quite an increased number of population. And this particular population in phase two, these are the people with a specific disease that this molecule is designed to treat. And then that's where we look as well at the safety and we try to identify the side effects that may be there. The effectiveness is the biggest because now we are introducing this to the population of a condition that we will be treating. And if we are happy, then we move to the phase three. And the phase three, that's where we have a large number of population. And this normally, it's a multinational um, research that has been done in different countries to look at the all safety, efficacy, quality of this particular product. All these uh, processes, they require intense monitoring to ensure that we identify as much possible safety uh, effects of this particular molecule, efficacy issues, and so that we can ultimately bring this and say, we have realized that the uh, performance of this product so far, it's, of, it's acceptable and it can therefore go for drug registration. So under drug registration, what is it that we do? Basically what we do, we do review of the information that have been, that have been collected throughout the development of this particular product. And that's where now <clears throat> we do the uh, submissions and the submission by pharmaceutical company, then it will include the clinical trial data and the drug development data. And then we do the inspections where we do the good manufacturing practice. We go to the plants. Uh, when I talk about the plants, basically I'm talking about the companies where these products, they are actually being manufactured to ensure that they comply with the standards that have been put out there. The clinical trial as they've been conducted as well during the time they were conducted, there was uh, there's monitoring that takes place according to the good clinical practice. And then when we do evaluation, we look at the safety, the efficacy, the quality, and then now determining which schedule should this product be put on. And then that's where we do the registration. And the registration in some cases, they will come in conditions of registration and that is applicable in the COVID-19 vaccines. Then lastly, it's the phase four, which is the post-marketing phase of um, the human clinical trials. And the phase four, basically what it means is that we are monitoring now the performance of this product on the market. And this is a long term. We are looking for that particular adverse events that could not be identified maybe in clinical trials. And this normally, those are the delayed ones or uh, the rare ones. So because now it's going to be used in a variety of patients for a longer period of time, hence we need to continuously monitor the performance of this uh, drug so that we ensure that um, the benefit risk profile of this product is maintained to be positive at all times. Next slide, please. So basically this is a summary of what I've indicated in the previous slide just to ensure that uh, I put it in writing. So on the post-marketing side of things, then we continuously as well review the international data, literature, safety databases, and regulatory decisions that were made elsewhere. And because 
this is post marketing, it's worldwide, then we need to be affiliated to organizations that also continue to monitor this. Then South Africa or SABRA is part and is an active member of the WHO program for international drug monitoring since 1992, whereby we send all our uh, adverse drug reactions for other medicines, including adverse events following immunization into a single database, which is owned by the uh, Uppsala Monitoring Center, which is a WHO collaborating center, and they do what we call signal detection. They try to identify safety concerns on a large database compared to uh, if it's only South African data. We still do that in-house, but if it's big data, then it's easier to identify. Then we also encourage reporting of adverse drug reactions and adverse events following immunization. We conduct the risk benefit assessments of health product as new information becomes available. And this I will show in one of the slides coming and we continue to be transparent and inform healthcare professionals and the public of any new safety issues that arise. Next slide, please. Then in the post-marketing surveillance, what is it that we look at basically? So we have what we call vigilance and vigilance basically it talks to continuously monitoring and evaluating the safety, the efficacy and performance of this product. So in terms of the vigilance, we look at the signals at highlight, as highlighted uh, that, way, that are new or previously understood. And the signals have indicated that these are, safety, these are new safety information that we're not sure, but we still need to uh, do more research on them and to say, yes, for sure, this, is, uh, this particular vaccine is resulting with this. Then we monitor the risk benefit of this product as highlighted. And then we also look for new risk factors um, for known adverse effects. For instance, now you know that um, if somebody that would actually develop a certain type of reaction, maybe it's because of one, two, three, these are the risk factors. So these are some of the things that we look at in the post-marketing surveillance. Next slide, please. Okay, so with the post-marketing surveillance continuing, then we have a collaboration or a working together with the expanded program on immunization from National Department of Health, where we support the collections and processing of adverse events following immunization. We also sit as part of the National Immunization Safety Expert Committee, which Prof will talk to, but on an observer status. And the reason why there's a National Immunization Safety Expert Committee is so that the decisions can be done independently and be provided to other institutions or organizations like SAPRA. Furthermore, we promote adverse drug events following immunization reporting, and we continue to keep the public informed um, through the microsite that we have or a dashboard on the SAPRA website. Next slide, please. So as I've highlighted, one of the key drivers of vaccine hesitancy, basically, it talks to the adverse uh, the side effects. So I thought maybe it's of importance that I share with you the top, the top 10 reported adverse events following immunization for COVID-19 specifically, uh, as of the 29th of October 2021. And this data is available on the SAPRA website. So I took a, a snippet of this and put it here to indicate this the top 10 reported adverse events following immunization for the currently available vaccines in the country, we're seeing headache, we're seeing local re uh, reactions, we're seeing pyrexia, dizziness. And these are some of the uh, reactions or most of these reactions basically, they have been identified during clinical trials. So we are not surprised. And these are the minor ones that are seen. So this is just to alleviate that fear that most of the people that have to say, you do not need to fear the adverse events following immunization. However, you need to fear COVID-19 because there we are, for, we show that the stats has highlighted that more people has actually died as a result of COVID-19. Therefore, the risk of, in, of uh, being vaccinated compared to the risk of COVID-19, we can all agree that the COVID-19 is more riskier if you were to, to look at the statistics, then it's more safer to actually uh, take the vaccine itself to prevent all that. Next slide, please. So I thought I should provide a number of uh, regulatory decisions, safety regulatory decisions, just to indicate 
um, some of the things that I've been saying that we do, and in practice, this has been um, shown out there, whereby there was a vaccine-induced thrombosis or thrombocytopenia identified elsewhere. And as a result of that, this was um, during the Sisonke study, where the rollout of the, study, of the study was actually paused. And then we had to review the data that was coming, that was available at that point in time. And then based on that, we had to make decisions to indicate, um, to, to basically to weigh whether the benefits of this um, vaccine outweigh the risk. And we say that, yes, for sure it does. And then instead we continued with the vaccines, we put the measures in place for screening and monitoring of participants at, at risk and update um, the participant information sheet. Furthermore, what we did, we issued uh, a Dear Healthcare Professional Letter to Healthcare Professionals, which is also available on the SAPRA website for the public to see. And we also issued a press release. And this is not the only case. We have quite a number of them. Now we are looking at the myocarditis, which has been identified in the USA. We also issued the Dear Healthcare Professional Letter. We also issued a press release to inform the public about this. So as new information becomes available, we continue to become transparent and share with the public. And furthermore, we continue to review this data uh, to ensure that the risk benefit of this profile continues to be po uh, positive. Next slide, please. Then what are the key messages out of this presentation? Uh, what I want to make it clear to the public is that monitoring the safety of COVID-19 vaccines and communicating any risk, it's a critical priority for SAPRA. And um, as I've highlighted, serious adverse events following immunization are extremely very rare for COVID-19 based on the currently available evidence. And I've also shown to you what we are receiving in the unit uh, based on the South African uh, reporting. And most of the adverse events following immunization received, they are non-serious as indicated. And we continue to monitor and inform both the healthcare professionals and the public of the up-to-date uh, safety profiles of COVID-19 vaccines. Next slide, please. So in closing, I would like um, just to share what Nelson Mandela said. Um, he indicated that health cannot be a question of income, but it's a fundamental human right. And he said, giving children a healthy start in life, no matter where they are born or the circumstances of their birth is the moral obligation of every one of us. I find it heartbreaking that 3 million people, most of them children, die each year from the diseases that we can prevent with simple, inexpensive vaccines. These are children who would have grown up to support their families, their communities, their nations. They would have been productive members of the societies that are still developing and need their children to be healthy and strong. By preventing these deaths, we not only would have saved children's lives, but we would also we would also would help strengthen communities and contribute to the development of the strong and prosperous nations. I so wish Nelson Mandela would have been here today because this resonates with exactly what we are saying today. It might not necessarily be children only. This talks to everyone because currently we also have started with the vaccination of um, children from uh, 12 years and above. So all I'm saying to you is that, can we please take this opportunity just to prevent all the death that have been taking place so far as a result of COVID-19. And for this slide, I'd like to thank my colleagues, uh, Kamusi Mutoti, as well as Kidibune Malaji. And thank you everyone for listening. Next slide, please. Thank you. Thank you, Taonga. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Flora, and thank you so much for ending us off on that very motivating quote from the late former President Nelson Mandela. Um, thank you for sharing the historical, historical perspective as well as highlighting um, the efforts from SAPRA in terms of ensuring safety, efficacy, efficacy, quality, and scheduling, and really quite importantly for highlighting that drug development process from preclinical the different phases of the clinical trial process, as well as for the post-market surveillance, as well as for sharing some of those top adverse events following immunization. And just, just to let our audience know that there is a wealth of information on the SAPRA website that you can actually access on sapra.org.za that has 
um, very useful information if you are looking for uh, further information. And a kind reminder to everyone that's posting questions in the chat, could you please post the questions in the Q&A part instead of the chat? That makes it a lot easier for our expert panelists to respond to you and for everyone else to see their responses as well. If you post them in the chat, it's going to get um, lost in a very long thread. So please do use the Q&A instead to post your questions. Um, thanks, Flora. Um, I'd like to invite Dr. Bishop Mpulwana uh, to please join us um, in the panel. Um, Bishop Mpulwana, I think, has a very interesting perspective as the chairperson of the Ministerial Advisory Committee on Behavioral Change. And we thought it would be quite important to try get a perspective from the constituencies that he represents around um, mitigating COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy. Uh, Bishop Kulwana, I'd like to maybe ask you quite broadly to try and describe some of the vaccine concerns that you seeing your stakeholders are raising and how the Ministerial Advisory Committee has been addressing some of them. Thank you very much for having me. and. Um... Greetings to the participants in the webinar. Uh, I think first I should say that um, um, members of the Ministerial Advisory Committee are actually all there in their individual capacities and they do not represent the organizations with which they are associated. And that applies to me too, as I'm associated with South African Council of Churches. I think you mentioned that at the beginning. However, because it is multi-sectoral, we all come from diverse sectors of society. It has a depth of experience and perspectives that enable the members of the MAC to appreciate societal challenges with regards to the COVID pandemic. And, and that's why and how why people behave the way they do. And I think that's really the strength of, of the MAC. I should also say that um, it is essentially focused on advising government Meg never talks to the public. It's not common that I do what I do here today. <laughs> Unlike the COVID, Mac, you'll have all the, profes the professors coming to speak. We don't do that. We only talk to government about what we think they should be doing differently. <laughs> um, and so anyway, uh, here I am. Uh, in this regard, therefore, we're able to, advise, to provide advisories to government of what might be helpful. Give an example, um, we will worry about um, how people that are coming to receive social grants be, you know, are all queuing up in the early morning and, and yet you're trying to say that you want to reduce the infection rate. So how differently can social development manage that through SASA in order to prevent this? You know, These are the kinds of things that we talk about. In addition, each one of us, in our respective daily spaces and our organizations. Of course, we contribute to the various efforts to bring down infection and to promote mitigating measures, including the vaccine. Um, and, and I'll therefore uh, sort of leave the, 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 the map for a moment to talk about whether, what then we do outside of that, even though we take what comes out of the, the issues we are dealing with in the map and then we take them with those out to our organization and say, hey, here is an issue that's emerging. What can we do in our organization to mitigate this? So that's what we do. All of us do that. The Muslim Judicial Council will do that. Uh, you know, the, 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 the Hindu, uh, Sabah, they will do this. All of us do the same. And the traditional leaders do the same in their environment. Contra lesser, all of us do that. Now, um, we believe that the most important thing is to empower a, uh, the, the leaders at the community level. One of the things that we have come to recognize, and this we do, and we have actually promoted this with government, that it's not so much important that you get government communicators at a time when, especially during election year, when people don't believe what the government politicians say, <laughs> uh, that it is better to empower the immediate influencers in communities. These then become the people that you listen to. And in fact, uh, we're operating on the assumption that every decision a person has to make about vaccine or otherwise is a decision that one makes as an individual, but also in relation to the people immediately around them. The people that your family, your friends, your neighbors, your pastor, your 
you, whoever is immediately within your, your, sphere, your sphere of influence. Therefore, it is better to invest in those people rather than to invest in more megaphones of government voices, because that's too distant from the immediacy of where people live. Um, and, 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 and for this reason, uh, we want to encourage religious communities. We want to encourage traditional leaderships. In fact, the MEC that I, I'm, part, I'm part of has had conversations with the leadership of the South African Medical Association of this, because the general practitioners are actually very important people. When you are sick, you go to your doctor. <laughs> Uh, the nurse at the local clinic, these people are critically important. Even when you have got an adverse event, such as um, uh, you know, Ms. Matala was talking about, I'm not going to go to a website to find out what Sapra is saying. <laughs> I'm going to go to my doctor or to my pastor. And these people must be enabled to deal with these adverse events. They must know uh, the list who are showing, these must be made fully available. We must make every effort to train those people to know what do you do when this happens? What do you do when this happens? I get a call from someone in Cape Town who says, I went to, 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 to do my, my vaccine and um, I came home and I took, um, I, I, I took my, 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 my high blood pressure pills and then I collapsed. Uh, I said, did you tell them when you took the vaccine that you have this condition and you would take this medication? Oh no, I didn't think about that, you see? Of course, I've got to explain to the person that you're not going to die, but this is the reason why this happened. So we need more and more of that capacity to be able to do this in enabling people. And for this reason, uh, the various uh, the, uh, myths that are being put out there have to be dealt with, not by government, again, I repeat, but rather by the, inform the influencers in within the sphere of a person's life. One example is the South African Council of Churches the heads of member churches uh, put together a task team that's made up of health professionals as well as theologians to go into some of these myths that we hear about the uh, you hear about the, the the mark of the beast population control the dna fetuses that have been used we have to deal with those things one by one in a document that is out there in the churches so that if you, if the local minister has a reference point that they can use in dealing with these things as they come in their environment. And so we find this very important that it must be done. Uh, we in the MED have been talking to the local government leaders, and that is the House of Traditional Leaders, Contralesa, and Salga, to say, what can be your contribution in your environment? Just one example. Um, you know, somebody is 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 is, is a woman who has her husband die and her mother. It, it, they both die, you know, one week after another uh, from COVID. And so, because she is this widow who is now sitting on a mat, she cannot make decisions, however informed, well informed she might be. And they want to slaughter a beast or two because the husband had cattle. Now. To slaughter two beasts on an occasion such as this is inviting people to a super spreader. It has nothing to do with the conducting of the funeral service. Everything to do with the fact that everybody comes to eat the meat and you don't want to put on a mask to cut a piece of meat for yourself in a, in a, in, in a, in a traditional setting. So, but that can only be properly managed and handled if the traditional leaders are part of the conversation about how best within their areas of sphere of influence and villages they can then begin to communicate differently about how we can sustain these cultural practices without, uh, without causing further spread of the disease. So for this, for this reason, we believe that it is important that all the players must be well informed and advised. And what has happened then is that these local government leaders have requested that there be a, a comprehensive information session, which will certainly make sure happens, but they've gone beyond that. They say, we want to be part of the communication that talks to the people in our villages so that you don't just have the health professionals, but you actually have Ngozi so-and-so participating, but Ngozi so-and-so clearly having properly informed and, and equipped to do these things. Therefore, we need to empower them also, as I said, with regard to uh, responding to adverse effects. 
One of the things that we are trying to do uh, is to use our religious influence. This is now outside of the map. We have established collectively what we call a religious forum against COVID, which brings together Muslims, Jews, Hindus, Christians, those in the, in the Council of Churches and those outside of the Council of Churches like the Bandu Church of Christ and the the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Latter -day Saints, which uh, has actually got a very widespread uh, campaign that they have, they've been running. So each of these, each of us are doing something in our own spheres, but we come collectively to say, we have got every Tuesday, our communication experts come together to say, what do we need to do more this week? And they bring that to the weekly leaders meeting on Thursday to say, we now think we should take this direction and that direction, and this gets authorized, and then we do it in our own spheres uh, as organizations. But one of the things that we are trying to do as Christians, now if I go deeper into the SSC sphere and Christian community, is that we believe that hum humanity are co creators with God. That's what our faith says. And that we've been praying for God's intervention to end the pandemic and for life to return to normal. That's not going to just happen. God then inspires science to produce the solutions. And we cannot say when those solutions come, oh no, this is not of God. <laughs> and, and then what then have we been praying for this time? So the way our scientists are co-creators with God, Christians particularly should view the vaccines as part of the answers to our prayers. And the swift effort uh, that has gone into developing these effective vaccines is actually the miracle we've been looking for. What more miracles should we be looking for apart from a swift solution that has been found? And we see the spirit of God at work, not just in the church, but also in every sphere of life. And therefore appropriate medical discoveries can, that can heal the land should be discerned as a present and a gift from God. And the vaccine therefore is not just a, a, an outside thing. It is actually a, of God. I was talking to you and I get to a shop the other day and I got get asked us two weeks ago, get asked by the manager to say, uh, what do you teach on vaccines? And I tell them what we do. And she said, he says, can you talk to one of my employees because uh, we are worried she doesn't want to vaccinate. So I say, well, if she wants to talk to me about it. So she comes up and says, I will not vaccinate because my pastor has fasted for 21 days and came out and said, none of his congregation will ever have COVID because he has fasted for 21 days. Uh, and he's, she says, I don't compromise on my faith. I will not until, and so I said, but what, do you really believe that just not fasting can prevent a, a, the virus getting onto one of your members in your church? She says, well, I, I've asked my, the wife of the pastor and the wife of the pastor says, if I think differently, I must pray about it and God will tell me. So until God gives me a sign, I will not do anything else. I say, have you considered that God might be talking to you through other people, through the webinars, through all the information that's around you? And she says, well, I don't think so. I want to hear it directly from God. You know what happened last week? Last week, I was going through the same shop to buy something, and this woman comes up to me. Do you remember me? I said, not really. She says, hey, I've just taken my jab. I'm the one that was talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> so I suppose God did talk to her. <laughs> so it is really to say the key thing is to empower the people of influence at every level. And I want to say, in, if I'm just going to bring this to a close very quickly, is to say uh, we need to recognize that the sanctity of life is paramount. And everything must be done to save lives. We cannot have a faith tradition that is able to live with the death of people in the name of God, because that's actually what you call human sacrifices uh, for religion. And that cannot be the case. We ought to have a faith that, that preaches the sanctity of life that says, have mercy for your heavenly father is also merciful. We believe that this is possible. We get people vaccinated against the virus in order, and that in itself becomes an act of charity because you prevent the spread there are people who cannot take the vaccine because of their conditions of health. And therefore those people will benefit if 67% of us or 70% of us have been vaccinated. And for this reason, the religious uh, forum against COVID is campaigning that seven out of 10 people in all our congregations 
must be vaccinated. And that is 70%. That can then be our contribution. And we are appealing that everybody and every organization that is the constituency should try to persuade seven out of 10, your friends, your neighbors, your family, everybody, seven out of 10, please get them uh, uh, vaccinated. And therefore we need to counter the information and walk the talk and all the leaders must publicize their vaccination so that people see that this is actually happening in public and we can all benefit from it. And I think that it's all about encouraging the local and making sure that people know what is happening. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop, for that very passionate and inspiring message. I think I really enjoyed listening to some of the real life stories that you have shared with us. And uh, I think it's some of the things that get missed when we have webinars like this, where we do have very you know, scientific information. So it's really good to get some of those real life stories that you have shared with us today. And I've heard you mention two very important things. I think one of them is around empowering the leaders in our community that are closest to us and are within our immediate circles of influence and also really building the capacity and training people to be able to communicate the right messages and even increasing the knowledge, knowledge scope around adverse events, adverse effects and how we can handle those. But most importantly about opening the communication channels and really having this multi sectoral approach from religious forums to traditional leaders, traditional healers, and everybody else that is really um, in close contact with our communities to be able to share um, the right information and to motivate and dispel disinformation. So thank you so much, uh, Bishop Mbulwana, for taking this time to speak to us and to everybody that has joined. I know you may need to um, drop off um, to join um, another commitment. So if anybody has questions for the bishop, uh, you may post them in the um, Q&A and we'll try to maybe get some responses from you um, after and share those uh, separately um, because the, the bishop- does There have. is a question that's been put to me and I'm gonna try and answer it before I, I step out. Please go ahead, Bishop. Thank you. Um, no, I'm answering it on. I'm answering it on on the Q and A. Oh, okay, all right. So I thought you were going well, to answer it. I, on I can answer. I can answer it. The question is, what do I have to say to the ACDP uh, that says, uh, you know, children do not need the vaccination. They must not vaccinate between twelve and seventeen. Um, I would say that uh, I'm not sure that any political party has the capacity to determine what is scientific knowledge. Uh, I would not put this to any, whether it, whatever the political party was. I would rather this were left to the scientists and to families to make determinations. One of the things that we promote is that there should be no verification of anybody that thinks differently, but people need to be advised and persuaded on what is right. But science is always going to be the lead in this matter, no politics. This is one thing that we should not politicize. And I believe that uh, South Africa is unfortunately in a state where everything gets politicized between political parties. And I think that we should try and create that sacred space where South Africans can come together on critical things without thinking about whom do you follow and support. Thank you, Bishop, for that response. And thanks again for your time. And I would then like to hand over to our next panelist, uh, Prof. Mayer. Prof. Mayer, please may you um, go ahead and share some of the information that you have with us around vaccine hesitancy, around the uptake of the vaccine nationally, or maybe dispelling some of the common myths around um, the, the vaccine. Over to you, Prof. Thank you very much. I am just going to try and share my screen quickly. Um, it was a very inspiring and interesting talk that we just had. Um, so I hope I can um, build on to that. Uh, sorry. Oh my goodness. Sorry, let me just move it to the other side. Oh my goodness, sorry about this. Um, I closed it now. It 
So to, to add on what the bishop has said, I think it's very important, um, especially when we look at the um, at the adverse events that I'm also going to talk about and all the myths that people um, are being faced with at the moment. And, you know, I think we should all focus on, on what is positive because we all want to go back to normality. So what, what can we do to go back to normality? Um, and, uh, you know, what we, we all hope to, to be able to go back to parties, to go back to sports events, um, to have fun over Christmas. And, and, and we should be focusing on that. And we should be focusing on the things that, that create fear in, in, in the minds of people. So um, I think it's, it's very important that we, you know, that we try and focus on those things. Um, let me see, can you guys see my screen now? Not yet, Prof. Uh, now? No, we are not able to see it as yet. Can you see it now? Uh, no, you have not started sharing. Oh my goodness. You were sharing um, earlier on before you closed it, we could yeah. see the presentation. Okay, but... let me try it this way. Um, okay, I'm sorry about this really. Can oh, you no. see it now? Yeah, yes, 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 yes. It's there now, yeah. It's just not in presentation. Okay, is it now in presentation mode? Uh, we are seeing the, the back end where your notes uh, are likely to be. Okay. And there you go now? Yes, perfect. perfect. Okay, perfect. sorry about this. <laughs> no problem. Okay. All right. So um, to add on to, to what he said then, uh, this is where we are at the moment. So I just want to um, remind everybody that we are still in the third wave. And we hear on the news and we read in the papers that there will be a fourth wave coming. We don't know exactly when. If we look at where we are in terms of vaccination, as you can see there, um, we have now vaccinated 22% of our whole population, not adults specifically. This is now the whole population. And then we compare it with the rest of the world. Um, you know, we're like halfway. Um, although if we compare ourselves to Africa, um, then we are quite ahead of some of the or most of the other countries. Now, um, there's some, some predictions that's being made by various groups, and this has been done by PwC. And as you can see, they actually pointed out three different scenarios, upside, baseline, and downside. Now, I'm sure we all want to go to the upside scenario where we can move through Christmas, um, maybe uh, lockdown level two, um, we can go down to lockdown level one again next year, and then by April, May, you know, we can relax a lot of these restrictions and, you know, try and go back to our normal lives. But we need to vaccinate 70% of the adult population by Christmas. That is the aim of the Department of Health. Now, where are we at the moment? So if you look at this graph, the picture doesn't look so promising. So the question is, are we actually going to reach that 70% that we are supposed to be aiming for? And if you've been uh, you know, watching the, the, the numbers of vaccines being administered at the moment, then um, you will see that our numbers are really quite low. While we need to aim for um, about 300,000 um, vaccinations per day, we are really way um, behind on that. Now, um, if we look at, you know, what the, the, there's been various surveys. Now, this is data from the John Hopkins Center for Communication. And if we look at how many people is actually not willing to accept the COVID-19 vaccine in South Africa, and this is quite a large sample of people, um, about 25,000 plus. And as you can see, yeah, it's, it's over the 30%. Um, say they will not take a vaccine. And then there's this, this group here sort of in the middle, which say, you know, maybe probably I'll probably not get it. And then the orange group will say, I'll probably will get it. And only the blue groups, yes, I have been vaccinated or, um, you know, I'm, I'm definitely going to get vaccinated. Now, what are the reasons? So Flora also actually mentioned some of these. And as you can see, 
the top reason there at the top um, uh, of, of the screen is the concern about side effects. Now, all the surveys point this out as the very first reason why people do not want to get vaccinated. People are worried, they are scared, they hear stories and so on. Quite a number of them also say, I plan to wait, you know, I wait, I'm waiting, I want to see what's going to happen. And that is not a good thing to do. And I'll point that out in my presentation as well. So, um, you know, with, with, you know, all these unanswered questions that people have, they create a lot of uncertainty, confusion and fear. And the bishop also pointed out that we need to communicate, we need to educate. Flora also spoke to that. We need to make sure that people actually get the right information. Um, and the question is, have we been, um, you know, successful enough, efficient enough in making sure that the right type of communication is reaching all the people in South Africa? We have 11 different languages. Are we reaching people who cannot, for example, read English? Are we reaching people who do not have maybe smartphones or cell phones or radios or TVs and so on? So to answer some of these questions, you know, are these vaccines safe? What are the side effects that we um, are facing? I'm going to try and answer some of these questions and allay some of these fears and myths. Now, the first one is, do we know what's inside these vaccines? So often people would say, you know, we, we, we are hiding uh, what's inside the vaccine. So the information is out there, like with any medication, when you open it, you take out the package insert and you will be able to see what's, what's inside the medicine. So inside the vaccine is the active ingredient and then there are some other ingredients there and they are called adjuvants. They are supposed to be, or they are included in the vaccine to make the vaccine work better, to keep it stable, to make sure that when it reaches the person, the body, that it's still in the good condition that it's supposed to be. So that's the reason why these ingredients are included. And as you can see, they are ingredients that we normally find in our everyday lives. We find them in food, we find them in other products as well. Then um, <clears throat> another question is, can the vaccine actually change my DNA? And the answer is definitely no. But there's still people who believe that the vaccine can change their DNA. So the vaccine only contains a messenger and that messenger instructs your body to make the spike protein so that your immune system can actually react and you know, uh, produce um, antibodies so that when you get into contact with the real virus, your body will be able to fight that infection or the virus so that you do not get a severe infection. Can the COVID vaccines introduce a chip into my body? Definitely no, it is not possible. Also, remember, Flora spoke to it. SAPRA make sure that vaccines are safe and they will never um, approve anything that they don't know what's inside the product, for example, or um, a vaccine that is not safe. So people can really rest assured that SAPRA make sure that all products, including medicines and other um, devices that we are using in the medical field, all of those are safe to use. Then do we know what's inside the J&J vaccine? So I've spoken about the, the mRNA vaccines. As you can see, similar to the mRNA vaccines, the Pfizer vaccine, as you all know it, there are certain ingredients in addition to the active ingredient. And all of these are to make sure that the vaccines work well and that they stay in a good condition. So what is not included in the vaccine? So I've included this to make sure that people can rest assured because there are many um, questions around it. You know, there are myths going around that there's all sorts of human cells included, these fetal cells included, all of those things are not true. There are no human tissue, no animal tissue, no pork products, no allergens, no um, antibiotics, no egg, no latex, 
um, no fine mercil or mercury or aluminum, no preservatives. So as you can see, none of these things are included in the vaccines. Then a very good question is, can I get vaccinated when I have an allergy? And people are always very worried about it. And together with the allergies is, is the question around anaphylaxis. And the answer is yes. These vaccines are actually very safe when it comes to allergies. So if you have an allergy, speak to your medical um, practitioner, speak to the nurse um, or your specialist, but you can definitely get vaccinated. The only um, instance where you will not get vaccinated is where you are where you have a contraindication. So you've had um, a previous, uh, maybe an anaphylaxis, or you are very um, sensitive to a specific product um, or ingredient rather, sorry, an ingredient within the vaccine. <clears throat> um, but yeah, it, it's really, uh, you know, it's very safe. And that's also the reason why people are being observed for 15 minutes at the vaccination site to make sure that there are no allergic reactions. And if there are any allergic reaction, um, that it can be treated immediately. So at the end of the presentation, I also have a short testimony of someone who had an allergic reaction and she then successfully get, uh, got her second dose. So there's a lot of new data being available now about this whole issue. Um, where people have previous allergic reactions to the mRNA vaccines, including people who had anaphylaxis. Um, so, you know, if you go to this paper, you can actually read about it in detail, but they were um, uh, more than nearly 90% of this group of people actually got um, their second dose. Um, a third of them were treated with an antihistamine or they got pre-medication, they got an antihistamine um, and they successfully, all of them successfully got their second dose and only 20% of them actually then had, um, you know, a second allergic reaction to the vaccine, but no anaphylactic reactions after the second dose. So that's really very good news. Um, and then something else I want to talk about is... Um, you know, anxiety related uh, reactions or what we call stress related responses. So they are different to anaphylaxis. And people also present, um, uh, you know, slightly differently when you do get an anxiety related reaction. Um, and that's also why, you know, um, everybody is being observed for 15 minutes after they have been vaccinated to, you know, um, manage anybody who presents with an um, anxiety related reaction. So in the US, they've actually, um, you know, did a, they actually monitored um, five of these mass vaccination sites. And they, they, they found that quite a number of people actually presented with an anxiety related reaction. So in other words, they, they fainted, for example, after they got the vaccine. So this is possible and we often see it amongst adults and we also see it amongst um, adolescents. And this is sometimes because people don't like needles. They are, you know, they, they, they are scared. Some of them are scared to see blood. Um, they don't like seeing people being injected um, and it creates fear. And then they present with these symptoms where then in, in, in many of these cases they would faint. And that is completely different to an anaphylactic reaction. So when you have an anaphylactic reaction, it, it happens also immediately after vaccination, but and it's a very serious reaction, but it can be managed 100% immediately. They treat you with adrenaline and you don't have any um, after effects. So um, just in terms of people who are scared, so some people would say, and I've also had people um, coming to me saying, I, I'm just too scared. I, I, I can't tolerate needles. Um, I cannot get vaccinated. So um, it's, it's quite interesting. One, as I say, one in 10 people actually um, do have a fear of needles. So if you are one of them, um, you are not the only person. But there are also ways to deal with that. And this is quite an interesting article where 
with seven people actually shared their experiences of what they did to be able to handle this fear and they successfully then got their vaccination. So um, another question is, does the vaccine contain the virus? Can it give me COVID-19? And the answer is also definitely no. So none of the vaccines can give you um, the, the, the COVID-19 virus. So this question often comes up when people um, got vaccinated and soon after that, they actually present with COVID-19. And the reason for that is that they haven't, um, your body takes at least two weeks to start building your immunity. So um, if you, you have been in contact with someone during that period, then you are not protected yet. So you're only fully vaccinated um, 28 to 30 days after the J&J vaccine and um, around five days after you had your second dose of the Pfizer vaccine. So um, rest assured, this vaccine cannot give you COVID-19. Another question is, does it cause infertility? And this is a very, very common question. And the answer is also no. So there's a lot of data already now being um, available. Um, also, where, um, as, you, as you might know or not, um, pregnant women were not included in the initial trials, but people did uh, fall pregnant. Who, who got the vaccine. So um, there's already a lot of data being available and um, these pregnancies were successful in these women who actually received the COVID-19 vaccine during the early days. But there are also studies at the moment um, on, on pregnant women um, as well as breastfeeding women. Then also can it cause um, erectile dysfunction or impotence and the answer is also no. On the contrary, they actually uh, found that, you know, it, it's not the vaccine, but it's COVID-19, the, um, the disease that actually has a very negative effect in terms of um, impotence and erectile dysfunction. So, um, you know, that, that's the downside of, of waiting to see what's going to happen. Are people going to die within six months and so on? Um, then, you know, while you are waiting to see what's going to happen, you can actually get COVID-19 and then you, are, you will face, you know, actually more serious consequences than what you would even anticipate with the COVID-19 vaccine. Now, should I be vaccinated when I'm pregnant and when breastfeeding? And the answer is definitely yes, um, because if you are pregnant, um, you are at a higher risk of severe disease when you do get COVID-19 during this period. So you can get vaccinated at any point of your pregnancy. It's also recommended that people who are planning to fall pregnant should definitely get vaccinated. So. Anybody within, um, you know, a reproductive age, it's recommended make sure that you do get vaccinated in case you also uh, fall pregnant. Um, so there's a lot of data already now, like I said, especially um, in the US. And this data from the, from the CDC actually showed that, you know, pregnant people with symptom, symptoms of COVID-19, so only symptomatic COVID-19, have a 70% increased risk of death. Um, and what they also found that only 31% of pregnant people have been vaccinated against COVID-19, uh, which is not good if you look at that, that risk. Then uh, this is the data from the, from the CDC. So you can see they followed um, 144,000 plus cases and they identified 227 deaths during pregnancy. And that's a lot of people. Um, then they also looked at the hospitalizations. So um, they didn't have you know, data available for all the hospitalizations, but as you can see, more than 600 cases of, of being admitted to ICU, um, more than 100, I think it was about 120, 30 um, on, on ventilators. And then this um, uh, number of people on, 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 on the right-hand side means they, they had to get special 
um, therapy because ventilation, their lungs were so damaged that um, they couldn't even use a ventilator on them. So it shows you the, the implications of um, COVID-19 when you're pregnant. I do want to share these um, stories. There's, there's lots of them out there, but this is a woman now recently in the news where she actually, or her family, appealed to people who are pregnant to get vaccinated, as unfortunately she was admitted to hospital in September um, while pregnant, and then she uh, eventually died in, in November. Um, her baby survived, but now this baby, um, obviously she doesn't have her mother or his mother. And there's some other stories as well. So she was also saying, um, I'll wait, it's too late now. I'll wait until I've had my baby and then I'll get vaccinated. And unfortunately, she um, this didn't happen as she died before that. I mean, here's another um, story from South Africa. I would also encourage you to join this uh, group on Facebook, South Africa Vaccination. Um, there's a lot of information available on this Facebook group. They are so good at answering questions and so on. And, and this one I saw last week, actually. This woman also was pregnant. She uh, got COVID pneumonia. She was in hospital in ICU for a long period of time while pregnant. She survived, and um, this was a little video when she was discharged, and then eventually she got vaccinated, and then she shared her story. Um, and what she said there is, is something that I think a lot of people can actually, um, you know, make their own, because she said, I was so worried about the side effects, um, but eventually I got vaccinated, and um, almost 12 hours later, I didn't have any, any side effects. So um, in terms of the side effects, I'm not going to go into this detail. I think Flora has spoken about it already, but it's important to know that anything that happens after vaccination does not necessarily mean it has been caused by the vaccine. And that is why we need to investigate that, as Flora has mentioned, because, um, you know, the all sorts of things happen throughout our lives and they are not necessarily caused by the vaccine. Um, the side effects that we expect, um, it's the mild ones, like Flora said, and we already know about them from the clinical trials. So um, they are the ones that we expect to see, they're mild, they go away within two to three days. Um, then there are some severe side effects, but they are very rare. Um, and Flora also spoke to those. So I can just point them out to you. I've mentioned anaphylaxis already. Then there's the red blo um, uh, blood clotting uh, conditions, um, thrombosis with thrombocytopenia and also venous thromboembolisms. And then there's myocarditis and pericarditis. So those are the, 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 the rare ones, but they are the serious ones. But when they are being diagnosed, they can also be managed. That's why you need to report them and you need to seek medical help when you see anything um, that is of concern to you. The real risks are actually COVID-19 risks. So although you, 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 you have a, 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 you know, a rare um, adverse events that possible, but when you look at those very same conditions in terms of adverse event, your risk when you have COVID-19 is so much higher um, as you can see on this graph on, on the right hand side. So your chances of having a pulmonary embolism with COVID-19 disease is much, much, much higher than um, the risk of getting it because of the vaccine. So you need to weigh your risks um, against the benefits. So um, the long-term side effects, we already know about them. Flora spoke to this, so it's not necessary for me. And then, um, you know, what are the real benefits? So the benefits is that we are less likely to actually transmit or pass COVID-19 on to the next person. And that's what we need to focus on. So I said in the beginning, we need to focus on the positive because we want to go back to normal. So as you can see here, when you are vaccinated, both people are vaccinated, you have a 200 times less risk of um, getting infected. And that's really something that we need to focus on instead of thinking about all the negative effects. 
Um, and then on the other hand, also, when you leave COVID-19, long COVID is now a huge problem. And there's lots of studies coming out now. And um, many people live with COVID-19 now for up to six months, um, up to even a year. And we don't know yet why all of this is happening and how this can be managed. And can you see yeah, anxiety and depression is one of the major uh, long COVID symptoms. And together with that, you know, the pandemic had a huge impact on people's mental health. Um, this is more about COVID-19, a long COVID. Sorry, Prof, to interrupt you. I may have to ask yes. you to please um, try and wrap up for our yes. next. I'm on my last couple of slides. I'm going to wrap up now. Thank you. So um, the, the benefits then of, of getting vaccinated. And just the last um, message, basically, it saves lives. So I'm sure you've all seen this in the in on social media. Um, people landing up on ventilators are those who are not vaccinated. Um, and then when you have COVID-19, you need to get vaccinated. This is a new paper that was published. Your vaccine provides you with five times the protection compared to natural immunity. So don't rely on natural immunity. Um, this, the very, very last message I just want to give to you guys is let's embrace the hope and the positive messages. Let's stop the misinformation spreading. Let's empower one another. Make sure that the information we are giving to your neighbor, to your family, to whoever is the accurate and positive information. And this is just some guidelines on how to spot fake news. So thank you very much. Um, at the end, there's some, um, if we still have time, there is a little um, audio that we can share about someone's experience who, who had an anaphylactic reaction or a very severe reaction, actually. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, that was so, so detailed, so comprehensive, and so useful. I think you managed to dispel a lot of the common myths that we have out there and the misinformation that's going around. So this is a really great presentation and um, really appreciate you taking us through those common misconceptions as well as the actual facts. Um, with that being said, I would like to give an opportunity to our last panelists for the day, Dr. Johnson. Dr. Johnson, we've had um, presenta presentations from all the other speakers and would really appreciate having a public health expert opinion, sort of trying to tie everything that we've heard today and really uh, hearing your perspective on the discussion around uh, vaccine risk mitigation. Over to you, Dr. Johnson. Thanks, Changa. Um, and, you know, I won't repeat what uh, the other presenters have given many, you know, and, and, and Prof Mayer gave a very detailed and comprehensive presentation. And, and hi to everybody who's on the call. I'm going to start off, um, and, and I, I won't use all the time, but I'm going to start off with a story of Peter Duisberg. Um, and and um, many people on this call may not know who Peter Duisberg is. Um, and Peter Duisberg is a molecular biologist. He works out of the University of California, and uh, he is an ex expert on, on um, retroviruses. And I raised Peter Duisberg because I think it's instructive about the way science works. Uh, at the time that the HIV epidemic was starting in the 1980s and towards the end of the 1980s, Peter Duisberg, uh, who studied retroviruses, which HIV is one, decided that um, there is absolutely no way that HIV, uh, uh, that AIDS could be a result of HIV. He first uh, doubted the very existence of HIV. Um, once HIV was shown uh, definitively to exist, he said there was no relationship between HIV and AIDS. AIDS was a completely different thing. Um, and AIDS was, uh, AIDS was caused by drug use. Uh, AIDS was caused by early antiretroviral uh, exposure lots of different things. Um, and, uh, and we saw the results of that in South Africa, right? We saw uh, the results of, of, of that sort of strand of um, questioning the orthodoxy and the science uh, in South Africa led to, to some very weird ideas about HIV and AIDS. Of course, uh, we look back at that now and Peter Duisberg has been completely discredited. Um, there's no question that HIV causes AIDS. 
there's no question that antiretrovirals have saved millions of people all over the world. Why do I raise that? The point is that when you early on in an epidemic, the science moves very quickly um, and it's often confusing. Often contradictory things come out and it takes time for the science to settle. Uh, and that's often why uh, you get contradictory messages coming out. Um, does that mean that scientists are wrong? No, it means that evidence evolves over time. And it's been the same with the coronavirus pandemic. We're still not sure exactly where the virus came from. Um, uh, it's, it's not clear to me that that matters. But, you know, we learn more and more uh, as time goes on. And so we've learned uh, a lot about these vaccines. Um, and, and, and a good example of that is the question of, of natural immunity versus a vaccine-induced immunity. Um, I was one of the people who said, well, maybe like we do in other diseases, maybe we should test people, see if they've got antibodies and then only vaccinate the people who don't have antibodies. But over time, we've learned that that's not a helpful approach because uh, the problem is that it's not clear uh, what your infection is. When you've been exposed to COVID, have you had a severe infection? Have you had a mild infection? Maybe if you have had a mild infection, you haven't really mounted a good immune response. What we do know is what Prof Mayer showed on at, at the end of that presentation, that vaccinated people generally are much, much less likely to be hospitalized and much less likely to die. So what we do know, the science is uh, absolutely settled, is that these vaccines uh, will keep you out of hospital and will stop you from dying. And that doesn't matter whether you've had the infection or haven't had the infection. So in a way, that issue of, 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 of natural immunity almost becomes irrelevant. Because given that these vaccines are, are, are in fact, by and large, incredibly safe, our aim is to keep people out of hospital and die, and, and, and stop people dying. So, so then it becomes, in a way, irrelevant about the, the debate of natural immunity versus vaccine-induced immune, vaccine immunity. Because the vaccines are so effective and by and large safe, uh, we would rather say, everybody should vaccinate because we know that the science is clear. So what do we have to do to address this question of vaccine hesitancy? Uh, and I'll use a framework that's used in behavioral, uh, behavioral uh, insights and behavioral sciences. And it's the, the acronym is, is EAST, E-A-S-T. Uh, and I'll, I'll leave you with this. We need to first make it as easy as possible. Um, and that means taking it to as close to where people are taking it to times when people can go, removing any barriers. So I, I was certainly one of these people who was uh, cautious about making people register. Let's make it as easy as possible, let people walk in. I think that's critical. Um, make it as easy as possible to get vaccinated, remove any barriers. The second thing is make it attractive. Um, so, and that's part of what we're trying to discuss on this webinar. Um, you know, uh, people must see this as a positive thing in their lives. They're going to get vaccinated because it allows us to carry on with their lives. It gives people a sense of safety and security, no matter who they are. And, and hopefully we can start to end this pandemic and allow our economies to open up and our lives to continue. It must be an attractive option. The S is for social. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, we must celebrate the fact that 15 million people of our of our fellow South Africans have already been vaccinated. 15 million people have said, yes, let's go and do this. This is a good idea. Um, and, uh, and I think we've started to see the benefits of that. So um, this is a social activity. Um, you know, uh, this is uh, something that we do as a community and our peers and our colleagues and our friends, our families, um, we all doing this. Um, and the last thing is T, so I said E-A-S-T, easy, attractive, social, and timely. Um, we, must, we must introduce vaccines at a time that it makes sense. Um, that means that we must say to people, if you want to carry on socializing or start socializing, if we're approaching the end of the year and you want to socialize safely, this is the time to get vaccinated. There's no better time than now, if we want to have a December and a December free of concerns, potentially of, of, of a wave of illness and death as we had last year uh, in December, as we had this year at the middle of the year. Um, we must make it timely for people to remember that it's an important thing to get vaccinated. 
Um, I hope that we all, you know, go away from today's session, uh, having addressed some of the concerns that people have. I know that some of the people on this call, we will never convince. Um, that's fine. That is your choice. Um, we don't have an agenda. Our agenda is to try and save people's lives. That's what we're trying to do. That is our only agenda, really, I promise you, uh, is, is to try and keep people safe and to save people's lives. So, um, uh, you know, but I, I hope that, that people go away from this with many of their questions answered and feeling a greater sense of security about these vaccines. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. I don't think um, the only one that's going to remember uh, East, easy as possible, attractive, social, and timely. Thank you so much for um, sharing that acronym with us as well as all the other insights that you have shared. And on the part of easy as possible and um, timely, I would like to remind everyone that the countdown to our next VUMA vaccination weekend is on, and this is from the 12th to the 14th of November. All the vaccination sites across the country will be open throughout the weekend to provide um, the free COVID-19 vaccine. And it's a very convenient opportunity to get vaccinated and protect um, yourself and your families. And you can simply present yourself at a vaccination site without an appointment where you will be registered and vaccinated. So. Uh, VUMA vaccination weekend is coming up. Uh, I think we did, we wanted to have some time for Q&A, but I have seen that our expert um, panelists have been responding at a very high, uh, at a fast pace through all the questions that you have been submitting. So it looks like those questions are being answered. And um, the Q&A has been very uh, well facilitated by uh, Prof. Bernard, uh, Prof. Sukard, and uh, Dr. McCarthy as well. So thank you so much for responding to all of those questions that have been coming in through Q&A. Uh, before I wrap up, maybe I can ask our speakers if they have, um, in the next three minutes or so, any last um, comments or words um, that they would like to share with our audience? Otherwise, um, I'm happy to wrap up. Um, so over to our speakers for any last thoughts. Uh, shall I start? <laughs> yes, please go ahead, Prof. Okay, yeah, so, so my, my final thought would be, um, you know, to add on to what everyone else has said, let, let's embrace, you know, hope as we are moving towards the festive season. And by doing that, let's get vaccinated, be the positive influencer. The Bishop spoke about, you know, we need to be influencers. So each and every one of us can be influencers. You might have someone in your immediate circle, a friend, a family member, you know, try and speak to that person. Make sure you have the correct information. Make sure you engage with the correct information and stay away from misinformation. Stop spreading it and, you know, look for help through the correct channels. And, and that's the only way that we are going to get, you know, the, the uh, uh, high proportion of people vaccinated. And then lastly, to reach out to those who cannot get to vaccination sites, who, who don't have the means, help them and um, to get to the vaccination site so that we can all get vaccinated. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Um, I'd like to thank all of our speakers Prof. Mayor, Dr. Johnson, Ms. Matlala, Bishop Mpulwana, we really appreciate all of you taking the time um, to share your expertise with us, as well as our uh, panel of experts that have been answering all of the questions in the Q&A. We'd also like to thank SAPRA and SARTAC and GCIS and PATH and Joy Public and everybody else that has been instrumental in assisting us to get this conversation um, done. So I think we have one minute remaining and really appreciate all of your presence and looking forward to sharing this recording. Uh, someone has asked, we will be sharing this recording with everybody that registered for the webinar today. So thanks so much for your time and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks and bye-bye. <laughs>